So Adi is um, is um, out of town today, so um, I need to sit in today. So and um, we have, as as is our custom, four very interesting um, presentations here. So we'll here from Amir Suat, who's the undergraduate at Harvard, um, from well, 21, I believe. Then we'll hear from Ben Oppenheimer from, from CU uh, Boulder. Uh, then Louise um, Edwards, who gave the um, ITC presentation, um, which regrettably I missed, but I've read good reports about it. And then from our own uh, Francesca Fornacini, um, who will we'll bring up the completion. So um, let's just get started. Um, Amir is um, a Harvard undergraduate. Um, he's been working with Harvard about an argument for a kilometer scale nucleus of two I parasols. Thank you, Charles. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Amir Siraj. I'm an undergraduate uh, at Harvard College. I work with Avi Loeb. And today I'll be talking a little bit about um, the newest interstellar visitor to our solar system, uh, which is now designated 2i Borisov. Very exciting. So 2i Borisov is the second known uh, interstellar or confirmed interstellar object to pass through our solar system. Um, it, would, it was discovered by a Crimean amateur astronomer named Borisov um, on August 30th of this year. Um, and with a telescope, he actually built himself, a 65-centimeter telescope. Um, and on the left is an image of uh, Borisov itself. Um, as you can see, it's a comet. Um, from what we know so far, uh, it looks fairly similar to solar system comets, including its uh, spectra. But um, there's a lot of things we don't know about Borisov right now. Um, it's still on its way in. It's, it hasn't crossed the ecliptic, so we'll have um, several months to observe it. Uh, but one of the things we don't know about Borisov is uh, its size. What, what is the size of its nucleus? Um, so for a quick, oh yeah, and here are the orbital elements of Borisov. As you can see, the eccentricity is over three. So eccentricity of over one is um, a hyperbolic orbit. Um, and so this very high eccentricity uh, gives us confidence that it's uh, truly of interstellar origin. Now, uh, just a quick overview of anatomy of a comet. Um, what we really care about, the size of the object that we care about, is the nucleus, which is at the center. It's this uh, rocky, icy snowball. Um, but it's obscured by the hot gas around it, the coma, as well as its dust tail and its ion tail. Um, and so the current constraints on the nucleus size of Borisov um, have been done by Karen Meech and her team at the University of Hawaii. Um, and they say uh, its radius is between 1 and 8 kilometers. Um, and in addition to that, um, we did a order of magnitude es estimate of its implied number density of similar objects by taking the inverse of the detection volume multiplied by the search time. Um, and we get uh, of order a few uh, 10 to the minus 3 similarly sized objects for, per cubic AU. And to make sense of what this means and um, why it's important, um, we have to take a look at the other known um, and uh, pending interstellar objects to put it in context. So first we have um, the famed Oumuamua. Um, it was estimated to be 100 meter in size. Um, it showed cometary like behavior. It's non-gravitational acceleration, but it didn't have uh, cometary jets, so that's still uh, an open question. Um, but what we want to focus on is its detection implied an abundance of around 0.2 objects per cubic AU. And uh, then we have CNEO's 2014-0108, uh, which is its interstellar nature is still under review. It's um, still pending. But if, if confirmed, um, it would be a one meter size interstellar object. Uh, it exploded over the Earth atmosphere in the Earth's atmosphere um, over the Pacific Ocean in 2014. So we don't know its composition. But its detection would imply around a million such objects per cubic AU. Um, and so now, to put this all together, um, here is a log-log plot. It's basically the size distribution of these objects, um, showing abundance uh, as a function of size. Um, and as you can see, we have CNEOs, we have Oumuamua. And then Borisov, we don't really know where it lies on the x-axis. Um, whether it's on the one kilometer scale or closer to the 10 kilometer scale. 
Um, and these would actually have very different implications. So the dashed blue line uh, corresponds to a power law slope of th uh, minus 3. Um, and as you can see, it fits quite well with the lower range of uh, sizes for Borisov. And the reason why minus 3 is plausible and uh, sort of reasonable uh, guess here is since um, mass goes as uh, size cubed, this would imply an equal amount of ejected mass per star per logarithmic bin. Um, and a slope of minus 3 would make, make it pretty much in line with, a little bit high, but pretty much in line with uh, estimates for ejected mass per uh, star. However, if Borisov was 10 times larger, um, that would imply that there's much more uh, ejected mass at higher, sorry, larger sizes. Um, and specifically at the eight kilometer size, we would, that would sort of imply like several hundreds, a uh, factor of several hundreds more ejected mass per star uh, than uh, seems reasonable at this time. So this tends to, this suggests that uh, Borisov is likely on the smaller size, um, on the, the smaller range of this uh, size estimate. Um, but if it's on the larger size, uh, if it has a larger size, that would be quite interesting because we would think those objects would be more rare um, and we wouldn't have expected to seen it. So um, that is the argument for why it is probably small. But the exciting thing is, since it's still on its way um, and hasn't even reached perihelion until, I think, December, um, we will hopefully have tighter and tighter constraints on the nucleus um, and we'll know its true size. And so that will allow us to test this theory and, and, and many others. So the true size of Borisov is coming soon. Thank you. Yeah, so that's the interesting thing, which is Oumuamua seemed basically like an asteroid. Um, and so there's many arguments for what Oumuamua's true nature is. Some say it's a, a dead comet that um, used up its gas. Some say that it is a comet, but it's emitting gas and, and or dust in a way that our solar system comets don't. And so that's why we didn't see jets. Um, so it's, it is very plausible that they come from a different um, population. Um, but we can't really quantify that because we don't know what population Oumuamua came from. Um, so in terms of the size distribution, this is sort of, most people say that Oumuamua is probably a comet. Um, we just don't know how it was emitting its gas and dust. Um, and so given that um, that's what this size distribution uh, would hold for. But certainly if Oumuamua was some uh, very statistically rare event of some <coughs> exotic object, um, like if it were formed in a, like, through tidal forces and some weird uh, binary system, um, then, then we'd have to just wait and see. But the, the exciting thing about interstellar objects is that um, as LSST comes online, um, we expect to see many, many more of these, as well as um, we expect to see many trapped objects um, in our own solar system um, of objects that have basically lost energy to Jupiter and are now trapped in orbits. And we can identify those orbits and we'll be able to sort of fill out the size distribution uh, very soon. Is the assumption that a lot of these uh, extrasolar objects become unbound by many uh, body interactions or that they're just bound to uh, multiple stars or uh, uh, just bounce the systems whose uh, center of gravity is uh, a lot larger than the astronomical So the assumption is that these are totally unbound objects. Um, then what unbound them, for instance? Sorry? What might unbound them? What might unbound them? That's a great question. So there are many different uh, sort of processes. One is, so there's processes uh, throughout a uh, star's life. So at the beginning, you have um, sort of ejection from close in into the star uh, through gravitational perturbations and you should get a lot of rocky objects um, and then later on throughout the star's lifetime Jupiter or you know its 
sort of largest planet uh, should be kicking out lots of objects as well. Um, but you also have the Oort cloud, which is this icy uh, cloud of objects very far away from the star. And so perturbations such as the galactic tide or other passing stars can free Oort cloud objects. Um, and so, you know, um, Borisov might be a freed Oort cloud object uh, because those have the sort of sort of lowest energy, their binding energy is, is lowest since they're far away from the star and it's very easy to free them. Um, and then later on in the star's uh, lifetime, um, perhaps the Oort cloud is actually released uh, if it expands and becomes a white dwarf. So those are the, there's many different subpopulations that could be predicted. Um, and as we get more data, we'll actually be able to drill down what are the, the, the subpopulations that we see and how do we square that with planetary system formation. Yeah, I would love to see that. That's very interesting. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you, Charles. Can everyone hear me? Can anyone see this? Um, let's, let's do this again. It just, it works before. <laughs> there we go. You know, it was in presentation mode. Okay, thank you. Um, today I'm going to talk about, ask this question, are circumgalactic gaseous halos scaled down versions of clusters? And uh, that's a nice intersection with the um, uh, work I am doing here with the um, um, CXC and cluster astronomers. Um, so I begin uh, uh, with dark matter, and I argue from this Ben Moore paper that's famous that you know dark matter's um, halos look very similar. They have self-similar scalings, such as these, and you know I can't easily tell which one hosts the Milky Way and which one hosts the Virgo cluster. Um, but when you look at galaxies, like we're more used to looking at, we can actually see them. Um, they look the galaxies that occupy them look very different. Um, maybe there's like aliens in the dark matter world that would look at galaxies and think they look the same. So who knows? Um, but uh, I wanted to talk about, think about the CGM, the circumgalactic medium. And how I uh, approach this question is to ask, is the CGM in hydrostatic equilibrium? Um, so we have simulations and we can look at um, the force equation, which is one of the things that uh, hydro uh, solvers, of course, um, uh, one of the three main uh, Euler equations used in that. And um, there's some formalism that cluster simulators and theorists have developed to look at if a, uh, if a cluster is uh, hydrodynamically supported um, uh, by uh, the thermal pressure gradient, um, and that way you can uh, 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 obtain the, the gravitational mass from the thermal pressure gradient. Or are there other terms? So uh, they break this equation down. Uh, the, ma the mass, the gravity mass, gravitational mass on the left side is balanced by these terms, um, of which um, you expect the thermal pressure gradient, m therm, an effective mass term for uh, the thermal pressure, to be the largest. Uh, and you have other terms that have to do with 
uh, velocities, such as m rote, um, any tangential velocity, um, m stream in, um, velocities in and out, um, acceleration, etc. So what we can do is, or what I can do, is look at simulations. I took, I looked at some cluster simulations, uh, clusters in the Eagle box, but I actually wanted to get a higher mass cluster, so I asked Ian McCarthy for a Bahamas um, cluster, and I looked at a few of those, and this is a very massive cluster. Um, and what uh, I plot here um, on your left side is those effective mass terms. Um, and the sum of them is in orange, uh, balancing uh, the total mass, the gra gravitational mass at each radius. Um, and uh, you can see it reproduces other cluster results of simulations that the DPDR term, the thermal term, is not, uh, about of order 90%. Um, so I like to plot things so that they're on a linear scale, so you can see the fluctuations more and the, the mess in the interior where a lot of things are going on. Um, this goes out to a three a megaparsecs, which is R200 for this object. Um, and you can see the more clearly the deviations uh, from hydrostatic equilibrium of other terms like the rotational support in green, uh, the streaming motions, et cetera, and they're pretty small here. Um, not included in the simulation is the acceleration terms, which I would, uh, from experience, uh, would, be, would make the orange sum term go closer to the black line. So what I did was I looked at my zoom simulations, which are use the Eagle prescription and are looking at, you know, to reproduce CGM observations and such. Um, and I applied the same formalism to uh, a Milky Way mass halo, which is mostly hot, um, but it has some cool phase. When I say hot, mostly 10 to the 5 Kelvin and above gas. Uh, and you can see something more different here. I do record the acceleration term, which is not dominant, but fluctuates more. So does the streaming term. But what is consistent across a number of halos that I simulated was that the while well, the thermal pressure gradient uh, dominates in the exterior, in the interior you have the rotational support term. And this is not you know, correlated rotation only. It's any tangential motion. Um, and this is a general feature of these simulations, is the high tangential support of the inner hot halo. Um, so I have a number of simulations of clusters, looking at clusters in Eagle, um, lower mass clusters, um, some of my group zooms, 10 to the 13 solar masses, uh, L-star zooms, um, and there's a progression that there is more rotational support in general that dominates within about 50 kiloparsecs around Milky Way-like galaxies. So I predict subcentrically spinning hot halos around Milky Way-like galaxies. Um, so there's some implications for that, and or as a cause for that, is feedback. Um, you have more feedback energy versus the binding energy in these small objects. Um, and in Eagle, there's a buoyant, you know, there's stellar and supermassive black hole thermal feedback prescription that we use in the, that I use in the zooms. And this buoyant gas, uh, this gas buoyantly rises via this feedback out to and beyond our veer regularly, uh, especially at high redshift. Um, and this makes up the auction six halos, which I try to simulate. And um, also, some of this gas falls back in, uh, into the inner halo, uh, much of it remaining in the warm, hot, 10 to 5 Kelvin plus regime. And this gives the hot halo uh, often significant uh, spin. And what I argue, this is the lambda spin parameter of different uh, components, including the cool CGM and the hot CGM, and those are the, the hot CGM is as high of a spin parameter in these simulations as the cool CGM. And in fact, if you, you know, sum up the total angular momentum, they, they are about equal at 90 kiloparsecs, and further out, you, would have, you have more hot mass, um, and you actually have more angular momentum in the hot phase than in like the cool disk. So, kind of to illustrate this with a movie that I made in, in the simulation before I published this uh, paper in 2018 was, um, you know, here's a, uh, one of the zoom simulations with a hydrogen disk in the center that's pretty big, like uh, at least 100 kiloparsecs across. But there's also an auction 6, 10 to the 5.5 Kelvin halo here, uh, which has some net rotation. It's not, you know, like, it's not, you know, a hot disk spinning that doesn't, that doesn't dynamically make sense. Um, but it's motions uh, fed by feedback over a significant fraction of the Hubble time. Um, so 
what I want to ask is, can we observe these? And maybe uh, I found you know, uh, this nice paper already by Edmund Hodges Cook um, that says our own Milky Way halo may be spinning at a, with a significant rotation velocity of you know, subcentrifugal of 180 kilometers per second, but the data is very rudimentary here. It's doing centroids and you know, very low resolved oxygen seven absorption lines with R of, you know, an R of 400 spectrograph. So this is an advertisement for links. And thanks with uh, working with Grant Tremlay and Alexei Viklinen, uh, we uh, took actually models, uh, you know, idealized uh, axisymmetric models of of Matthias Ormani and Emmanuel Sobacci, and we need to do this with the simulations as well. But we argued that um, uh, you should be able to see a double peaked line profile and resolve that with a high resolution x ray grading spectrometer, uh, such as on Lynx. You know, maybe if Arcus could be approved. Uh, approved. Uh, you could see this double peak profile with an inner hot, co rotating hot halo more at zero kilometers per second and an outer hot halo that's static um, and has um, a, a larger uh, net velocity. So um, it's interesting, there's, you know, if you plot the point up there of this uh, hodges Cook paper, they're all over the place, so it's maybe not correlated, perfectly correlated uh, hot halo rotation, but um, I think it is a future avenue to try to observe and understand the dynamics of gas cooling and uh, re-accreting uh, in the CGM. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's not. I mean, this is a, a result that um, you know a number of simulations have seen is that um, feedback, you know, traversing a large you know fraction of the you know of the CGM um, gains angular mo momentum. So yeah, the uh, the stars are have less um, you know less spin parameter than the dark matter um, on average. I haven't thought about that. That's a great question. Um, you know, you know, going back to my talk yesterday, you know, do it, it depends on the model. I, I think it might be something if you look in like illustrious T and G, where there is like you know pretty strong evacuation of of halos um, by black hole feedback. Um, you could feed a lot of angular momentum in a correlated way, um, but when that happens, I don't know. Uh, Sounds like a project to do. So, okay. yeah, I just have a, uh, there's a lot to Let's transfer see. here. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. But to try this. Yeah, it tries to be poetic. <laughs> <laughs> 
And to start with a very beautiful picture here. Uh, but, you know, like, like, imagine that the islands are galaxy clusters and the sandbar is a filament between those clusters. And maybe those two little people are h alpha emitting galaxies. <laughs> Uh, here is still a cartoon, but less of a cartoon of that idea of a real system. Uh, Abel 1763. Uh, the purple represents uh, X-ray emission, and the blue are star-forming galaxies, and the green are star-burst galaxies, uh, and also have AGN. Uh, the one in the middle is a um, bent double O radio source that we found. Uh, the filament was known before the um, bent double O radio galaxy was found. Um, and uh, the red dots are just uh, regular red galaxies in the cluster. <clears throat> so the idea is, could you maybe use the idea that there's a larger number of starburst galaxies in filaments to somehow identify the large scale structure, sort of filaments between clusters as a motivation for this project? <clears throat> uh, so here's the same thing, 1763 in a less cart, a third less cartoon <laughs> version, um, but still a little bit cartoon, uh, just to show um, the actual data. So like this uh, system was explored using optical, infrared, uh, like near infrared, mid infrared, UV, radio, you know, explored it uh, to death um, to find this excess of starburst galaxies in between um, the two clusters. So. Maybe starburst galaxies trace the large scale structure. Uh, another example um, in Coma, where we did the same thing, looked through a whole bunch of different uh, wavelengths, uh, looking at the star formation rate and the specific star formation rate of galaxies. And uh, the point of this uh, graph, the um, uh, red galaxies density gives the contours. The red and black dots are dead galaxies, and the Blue and bright blue galaxies are the star bursting galaxies. You see them on the edge of the galaxy cluster core. Um, so starburst galaxies outside of the core. So the idea then is to use CTEL on the Canada France Hawaii telescope um, to try and see if we can find the large scale structure lit up by these starburst galaxies. Uh, so CTEL is this amazing IFU that is eight arc minutes by eight arc minutes. It's a Fourier trans transform spectrometer, um, so it's like seeing limited in its resolution. It's really good for emission lines. It doesn't uh, see absorption lines very well, but it traces em emission lines really, really well. So we're going to use this large field of view IFU to try and trace emission line galaxies uh, in known superclusters. Um, so uh, looking at the set of daft clusters, which are from Duray uh, 2016, there's a set of about uh, 20 um, superclusters that they find. Um, and here the red is, again, the cluster structure found by looking at the density of red galaxies. Okay, so it's a proposed large scale structure of this um, cluster, CL0016. Uh, the dots are galaxies that have um, spectra. That black circle in the middle is um, one megaparsec radius. So we're looking at, you know, the structure around the cluster. Um, and then the idea is to point CTEL, huge field of view, spectra for every pixel, um, at some of this structure and see if we find some emission line galaxies, hopefully finding them outside the core of the cluster. Uh, so that's the idea. <clears throat> so CFHT has uh, given us a bunch of time. We have data for zone zero, which has already been um, analyzed, and that's the new result that I'll show in a minute. Um, and we also have data for zones two, one, and four, which are differently numbered in the next slide. It's an arbitrary numbering, doesn't matter. Uh, which I've just taken a brief look at, so we'll get a peek uh, today. And then also 
looks like we're going to get um, our last zone as well uh, uh, next semester. So we've been collecting data for uh, about a year and a half. So just a reminder, CTEL is eight by eight art minutes. So, you know, you can plausibly map some large scale structure with spectroscopically, which is kind of cool. Uh, so today we have the galaxy plus the sky, uh, subtract out the sky, and then we get hopefully an emission line, right? Uh, this cluster is at a redshift of 0 0.054. So we are looking at the, um, so CTEL is wonderful as it is. It doesn't give you the full, you know, you have to, you have to pick and choose what you get, right? Like with this huge field of view, you don't also get the full optical spectrum. You get um, uh, small bins of the optical spectrum. Um, so we can't, like it would be nice to get H alpha, for example. Uh, we, we can't get that. What we can get, however, is O2. So that's the emission line we're looking for. O2 redshifts into um, one of the filters for this instrument. And we have two sources, okay? So this is the exciting thing. We have two sources. We have two emission line sources. Here's the cluster core right here. Uh, and here are our two sources. These are um, line emit emitting galaxies. Here's, here's their spectra. Here's their bright emission lines right in the expected region of 023726 at this redshift. And actually, um, just zooming a little bit in on this source, we actually have a separate data for here and for here. This source looks a little fuzzy, and we can actually look and see if there's a velocity difference between those two parts of that source. Uh, so, final result that is new is this is where these two galaxies are, outside of the cluster core. That's very good, right? Uh, so, um, our two emission line sources are right here. And we're currently working on zone two, which I've all, we've already found um, 10 possible sources. Uh, I'll show a few of them here. Uh, and still to look at zones three, four, and two. So um, the hope is, I, I mean the prediction, is that there are uh, lots of emission line galaxies in between the clusters, and that that can be used as a way to confirm the large scale structure of this, um, this source. Hopefully this lends support to the use of the filament finding algorithm, right? The photometric method that produced the um, contours, right? That produced the location of the substructure. Uh, since larger surveys coming online in the next decade should provide a lot of this. I think that's it, yes. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, other than the fact that we saw it before, uh, is, I mean, there should be, like, you know, if you believe in pre processing in groups. Right? As these galaxies fall in to the dense cluster core, it could be, you know, so it could be that gas somehow gets like um, co um, condensed and a starburst happens as the galaxy falls into the cluster. It could be that these, you know, galaxies are in groups that are in falling into the cluster um, and starbursts are happening um, through interactions in the group. Um, it could be that like, gas hasn't been stripped out of these galaxies yet since they haven't fallen into the cluster yet and so that's why you get starbursts but the real motivation was that when we studied this system really well we found an excess of starburst galaxies in the a like in the already known filament so the idea is oh maybe we can use that as a tracer Oh, I mean, that would be awesome. They don't have one uh, built yet, or they didn't when we did these um, observations. So CTEL is a brand new instrument. It's only been on CFHT, CFHT for like a couple of years. Um, so uh, when we're starting, you know, there was only about three filters that we would want to use. And none, you know, like um, H-alpha just 
redshifts way beyond where the filter actually catches. We're, you know, I was, we're, um, I'm working with Florence Dure on this project, so we were really like, we're looking for a way to confirm her clusters. We're not looking at, you know, like the best large scale structure to fit into the available redshift window. We want to be able to confirm the structures that she has identified in hers. Do you see do you know what I mean? Yeah. There is a group though, I will advertise, uh, from University of Toronto, um, Liu and, oh, the supervisor? <laughs> CNOX, the, the main guy who did CNOX, the Canadian Network Cosmology. Anybody know? Who am I talking about? Anyways, pardon? Yee, Yee. yes, thank you. Thank you, yes, <laughs> Eric. Uh, yeah, Yi and Liu um, are doing a very similar thing with nearby, more nearby systems. So they're looking at a system at a redshift of 0.2 uh, where they can catch H alpha, they actually have a hundred sources outside of their cluster core. So advertisement for CTEL in general uh, to do this. Oh, I mean, like uh, lots. Uh, <laughs> there, it's seeing limited, and it's eight by eight um, arc minutes. So let's just imagine that the pixels are half an arc second across. Thank you. Yeah. 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 It's the cubes are huge. Um, so for this one, yeah. yeah, sure. For this one, uh, this it, this particular one is at a redshift of point two. It's a bit closer. Okay. Uh, and so Sorry, this is going to be, oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so here we go. Mm -hmm. This black circle up here gets the cluster core and it's a megaparsec across radius. Okay. And then, so one pointing of CTEL easily gets that. Oh yeah, I expect to find more over here. And so we found two here, right? And there's about 10, looks like there's about 10 in here. We haven't done the other boxes yet. But I expect, exactly, I expect to find more further away. And if you look at this one system that's a little bit closer by, right, this is the cluster core here. And the, these star forming galaxies, they're in the middle of the filament, like stretch in the middle of the filament. So they're, you know, I think this is about three megaparsecs from here to here. Yeah. Need to give the microphone. Yes, yeah, so today the systems I'll be telling you about are specifically high mass X-ray binaries. So those are systems where you have a uh, black hole or neutron star that's actively accreting material from a massive uh, stellar companion, either through Roche lobe overflow as shown in the image or from wind accretion. And when we look at uh, star forming galaxies, which in this case I'm defining as galaxies with high specific star formation rate, um, in the nearby universe, um, if we compare their X-ray luminosities um, and their star formation rate, we find this nice correlation. 
um, which is driven um, by the high mass X-ray binary populations. These systems are relatively young. They turn on about um, 10, 50 or so million years um, after a starburst. Um, and so you find this nice correlation between X-ray luminosity and star formation rate. Um, but first focusing on the little z, what happens if we try to look at this relationship with redshift? So there have been a couple of studies that have done this um, in recent years. And so what's shown here is one of these studies. So on the y-axis is the X-ray luminosity per star formation rate uh, as a function of redshift. And so this is based on stacking a lot of galaxies uh, in the Chandra Deep Field South. And the blue line is showing a fit to the data, and the red line is actually coming from population synthesis models. Um, and so there's, uh, there seems to be an evolution, an increase in this relationship with redshift. Um, and it's thought, the, the models um, uh, say that this could be coming from the metallicity, a metallicity dependence in high mass X-ray binary populations. And so this is from a population synthesis study, and this is showing the extra luminosity per star formation rate now as a function of big Z metallicity. Um, and so you can see that at low metallicity, these models predict that um, this ratio should be higher. You should see more luminous HMXB populations. Um, and what is the basic um, physics uh, driving this trend? Um, well, let's imagine here that you have a, a massive stellar binary at high redshift and at low redshift. And let's just focus on that more massive companion, the one that's going to evolve more quickly. Um, so that massive companion um, has a stellar wind. Um, the low Z star has a weaker stellar wind. Um, and here I'm really talking about the radiatively driven stellar winds during the main sequence, lifetime of the star. And so during the course of their lifetimes, these stars will lose some amount of mass uh, through this stellar wind. Um, the star at higher metallicity is going to lose more mass than uh, the low metallicity star. And so when they explode, um, that high metallicity star is likely to form a less massive compact object. So at low metallicity, when you're looking at populations of HMXBs, you expect to overall see more massive compact objects. Um, an additional effect is that because these winds are also weaker at lower metallicity, the binary as a whole loses less angular momentum. And so um, some uh, models predict that you would also end up with more Roche lobe overflow systems as opposed to wind accreting systems. And those Roche lobe overflow systems can have higher accretion rates. And so these effects combine to give you more luminous HMXB populations at low metallicity. And there's several interesting kind of associated implications um, if this is true. Um, for one, actually seeing this would help us to constrain uh, models of massive stellar evolution. Um, but it's also connected to the possible progenitor pathways of gravitational wave sources. Um, as uh, you probably all know, some of the first events detected by LIGO, the black holes that were detected had much higher stellar masses than the stellar masses of the black holes we see in X-ray binaries in our own galaxy and nearby galaxies. Um, and so there's a question of how are these produced? Um, do these actually evolve from massive stellar binaries that go through an HMXB phase? Um, do they instead form um, via dynamical processes and clusters? Um, and so seeing what happens at lower metallicity can inform whether you might actually expect to have these more massive black holes in lower metallicity galaxies. Um, another uh, interesting uh, associated implication is what is the contribution of X-ray binaries to the heating and the reionization of the intergalactic medium in the early universe? Um, as you'd expect to see some of these systems born from the first generations of stars, um, and that X-ray heating can have an effect on how the reionization process proceeds. And finally, um, if instead, you know, HMXBs are just kind of more of a contaminant for you than um, an object of intrinsic interest, um, as we try to push to fainter and fainter limits in terms of identifying AGN, in terms of identifying intermediate mass black hole candidates, 
Um, in dwarf galaxies, dwarf galaxies tend to have low metallicity, and so you want to know how much HMXB contamination um, to expect when you're performing these sorts of uh, X-ray searches. And so we do have some evidence that this metallicity dependence does in fact um, exist. And so this is from a study uh, looking at samples of nearby galaxies um, observed primarily with Chandra. And so you have extra luminosity per star formation rate as a function of oxygen abundance. Um, this is coming from uh, strong line em emission lines in H2 regions. And so it's a proxy for the metallicity um, of young stellar populations, including the HMXBs. Um, and you can see there's a lot of scatter here, and the triangles are all upper limits because these are all extremely um, low mass um, galaxies. And so a lot of times you don't even get, um, you don't even have enough star formation to actually produce a substantial HMXB population. Um, but there does seem in any case to be an overall trend. Um, and this line here is the line from the population synthesis model I showed earlier. And there's at least some um, rough agreement. Um, but it's known that the samples that are used in this study are, could definitely be biased. They're definitely not complete. Um, they're pulled together from different surveys targeting galaxies for different reasons. Um, and so you'd really like to be able to study this more uniformly. And as I mentioned before, the redshift evolution of X-ray luminosity per star formation rate could be the result of this metallicity dependence, but that hasn't been shown. Um, and so what I've been working on is really kind of testing this hypothesis. Is the redshift evolution driven by metallicity? And so what I've been doing is I've been putting together spectroscopic samples of galaxies at different redshifts and trying to see when I look at the metallicity dependence of these different, uh, of these samples at different redshift, do they all lie on the same correlation or do you see something different? Uh, do we actually not see the metallicity dependence that's seen locally? Do we see that, but there seems to be some additional offset that's being driven by other things that change um, with regards to stellar populations at higher redshift? <clears throat> And uh, this is challenging because these objects are very, very faint. Um, even in the Chandra deep field south that has the deepest uh, X-ray sensitivity of any extra, extra galactic field to date, you only detect a small handful of these objects at high redshift. And so we really can't just uh, invest more time in getting individual detections. Um, we have to uh, do x-ray stacking and measure just the average x-ray properties for large samples um, of these objects. Um, and the other reason that this work has been difficult to do previously is that if you want to look at these systems at uh, high redshift and you want to know their metallicity, um, then you really need to do large near-infrared spectroscopic campaigns. And so the first sample of galaxies uh, that I've worked with comes from the MOSDEF survey. This was a large near-infrared spectroscopic survey targeting galaxies at redshift 2 performed with the MOSFIRE spectrograph um, on Keck. Um, and uh, Mo the MOSDEF survey obtained uh, rest frame optical spectra for 1,500 galaxies at Z of 2. And these are all in the candles fields. So it's where there's really deep X-ray data. And so this really provided the first opportunity to really test this relationship um, at high redshift. Um, and to measure metallicity, uh, these are the, the key uh, emission lines um, that I was using. And so uh, I'm showing our sample here. So this is just showing the sample. Um, there's the H-alpha star formation rate versus stellar mass. The, um, the gray points here are all of the MOSDEF galaxies that have an H-alpha detection. And then the subsample that are in the colored uh, circles, those are the ones for which we have enough lines to obtain a metallicity measurement. And so putting together, um, uh, trying to screen out AGN as much as possible, we end up just with 79 galaxies out of these 1,500, which gives you a sense of why it's been so difficult to do these measurements. And so stacking the, the, the X-ray data, we get uh, very, very deep exposures. 
And so we are able to reproduce with our stacks the redshift evolution that's been seen previously. So this is just kind of confirmation of previous studies. Our sample is similar to those previous studies. Um, and if we focus on the galaxies that have very high specific star formation rates, these are the ones that we expect to be really dominated by just the HMXPs. And so we find a definite, if we look at the extra luminosity per star formation rate versus metallicity, um, we find definite evidence for this metallicity dependence at Z of 2. Um, and if we, again, just focus on the high specific star formation rate galaxies, we find that they lie very close to the local relation, which is shown by this dotted line here. And the dot dashed line is that population synthesis model that I was showing before. Um, so this is the first evidence we have that the redshift evolution of HMXBs is really driven by this metallicity dependence. Um, but there's still some issues with this first study. One is that, again, as I mentioned, we're not sure if the local measurements are biased, and so this may not be the best comparison sample. And we'd also actually like to be able to constrain this relationship better. At high redshift, we've only been able to get in the end these two points. Um, and so I've been doing more work with more low redshift samples of galaxies. These are all in the cosmos field. Um, so these are these points down here. And if we put all of that together, we're starting to see um, a pretty consistent story across redshift. Um, so the different colors in this plot are the, uh, the samples at different redshifts. And you can see that they all follow the same relationship. They are all statistically consistent with each other. Um, and they also happen to be consistent with sort of the lower bounds um, of the theoretical models that have been developed thus far. And so we're already starting to be able to actually constrain um, some of the population synthesis models. Um, so it appears that the ZZ connection really does exist. To do better, we're really going to need much larger spectroscopic samples at high redshift. We're going to lead the larger and deeper X-ray surveys. Um, but in the meantime, some things we're working on. One is that we're trying to test whether we can really see whether this metallicity dependence is really due to the fact that you have more massive compact objects. And so we're using um, New Star uh, doing surveys of some nearby galaxies to try to uh, place constraints on the relative ratio of black holes and neutron stars in HMXBs. And I also do spend some time thinking about low mass X-ray binaries. Um, it's seen that their scaling relationships evolve with redshift as well. And that's thought to be due to an effect of stellar age rather than um, metallicity. Um, and so this is something I'm currently working on too. So with that, I'll take questions. Um, so it's a bit of a combination. Um, so th there's definitely the limits in terms of the X-ray survey. So uh, going to lower redshift, you know, performing stacking in Cosmos, you end up having like a good mixture of the, the size of the sample size versus the depth. But it's really kind of the combined thing together. When you, and when you look at, um, you know, the Chandra Deep Field South, Good South, you have much deeper X-ray data, but then you generally have smaller um, samples of galaxies because you're, you're, ju you're just looking at a smaller volume of space. Um, so um, the depth is also really important for um, removing AGN from the sample, at least X-ray AGN from the sample. Um, so it's really kind of the combination of the two, the two things. Yeah, so, um, so when, um, so the plot that I showed that combines everything together, um, I've used the um, local um, um, uh, relation, scaling relations from like Cooley 2008 to effectively convert the two to the same metallicity scale. Um, it is true that we're not necessarily sure that um, really any of these metallicity indicators have no evolution with redshift. Um, and that's something in particular that I would worry about with the sample at redshift 2. 
Um, but at least um, a lot of the Mosdef survey has actually done a fair amount of work on this, um, as well as work from Chuck Steidel's group. And it seems like where, whereas like nitrogen-based indicators definitely show a significant evolution with redshift, um, when you use oxygen-based indicators, those actually don't seem to show very significant evolution with redshift in terms of determining metallicities. So it's the best that, uh, that we can do right now. And that's what we used is the oxygen-based uh, indicators. Yeah. Um, so you have prescriptions like, do, if I do, I'm doing simulations of, like, you know, um, uh, Ibu Zeta stack, yeah. galaxy halos, yeah. and we don't have X-ray binary, but it seems like that that's quite, quite possible to do. Yeah.